<clears throat> All right, well, happy, what is today, Wednesday? This is not a normal streaming day for me. Um, had a little bit of a fire lit under my butt to get the Celtic bus done because um, a friend of mine who is the owner of Broken Egg Games, which, by the way, is a great place if you um, play any tabletop games like War Machine, Warhammer 40K, any of those types of games, they have tons of cool tokens and little um, like measuring devices and all sorts of neat stuff uh, to purchase. Um, shoot, my uh, I was getting the red flash that I was losing frames there. Looks like it's calmed down. Um, anyway, so my friend who's the owner of Broken Egg Games uh, is going to be at Gen Con next week and is going to be selling uh, some of the Celtic busts there and wants the... Um, wants the painted models there essentially as examples to show people who are going to buy the busts and maybe even sell the painted versions there. Um, so fingers crossed that the sale goes well. Hopefully um, most of the rest of the busts will get sold there at Gen Con. But anyway, I want to get the second set all done before then so that he can have two painted sets. This painted set's going to have the blue face paint on there. The original set's going to be just plain. So I kind of want to have both examples done, send both pairs of painted models. So. I want to get both of these done this week, which means that I might be streaming um, some more. I might stream again tomorrow night, and I might stream some on Saturday. It depends how quickly I finish these busts. Um, but yeah, I need to get them to him on Sunday, so before our normal streaming time. Um, I'm not super worried. I mean, obviously, the paint along had been going every Sunday. I don't think anybody had actually started their busts yet. Um, nobody had sent me any pictures or anything like that. So. Um, I'm just going to have these videos, they'll still be archived, anyone who buys a bus can still you know, participate in the paint along and hopefully then anyone who, um, man my, my red light is flashing like crazy, um, anyone who purchases the bus at Gen Con then can actually go and see and that the, all the videos are there. Man, my connection is really, really wonky. We're going to start, see if it calms down. If it doesn't calm down, I'll reset. I'll reset the stream. That usually does it. Sometimes I just get a bad connection to the server. Hey, Jesse. Good to see you, man. Are you still on vacation or are, are you back now? All right, looks like maybe it's calming down. Uh, just to kind of show everybody, if you haven't been painting along with us, what we're working on. These are the finished versions of the two busts. So we have what I'm calling the Celtic Clan Chief, or Chieftain. And the Celtic Warrior. So that's what we're working on. Here's the stage that we're at. Man, still tuning in on vacation. You're dedicated. I love it. Um, so here's the where we're at here. Um, we've got the shirt, kind of the rough shirt done. Uh, we've got the tartan done. We've got the leather armor on his chest done. We have not done the leather strap. Um, we haven't done the hair and we haven't done the weapons. That's pretty much where we're at. And then like I said, um, on these ones, I'm planning to also do sort of a bonus episode at the end. Do the, the blue face paint that you see on them sometimes. Um, do that as well. So let's just jump right into it today. Um, we're going to work on the leather bits. Um, I'm just going to be checking my notes over here from time to time. All right, so I'm going to base coat the leather areas in uh, the Scale 75 Warfront Camo Red Brown. Um, you can see it actually doesn't really have a lot of red in it. Um, it's just kind of a mid-tone brown with just a slight reddish tinge. Um, you know, when I put it down, it's, it actually even looks redder on camera than it does in real life. I 
But I don't know if anybody of you who is out there is planning on going to Gen Con. But if you haven't picked up a, a pair of busts yet, that would be a good, um, a good time to do it because if they sell well there, um, I might not have, I might only have about 10 or 15 left after them. I'm sending almost all of my stock with him, so um, hoping that goes well, but there won't be too many left potentially. Um, you can also, if you want to see these painted versions in person or maybe even uh, purchase them, head to the Broken Egg Games booth there at Gen Con. Put it better way. This is a better version of tutorials. That's very nice. Yeah, I feel like I, I really need a vacation, um, partly just to kind of decompress. I've been working like crazy for the last several months, and it's really not going to let up until probably potentially November. Um, but I would love, I have, I've got several like painting videos saved. I've got several um, PDF tutorials from really good painters that I've, I've got, um, but I really want to work my way through, and I just I do not have time right now. Too many other things going. My painting time is devoted to this paint along or to the Atlantis Miniatures stuff. I'm planning to paint tonight for, you know, normally I paint for about two hours. That'll probably be a similar time tonight. Um, might go a little bit long depending on where I'm at. I'm hoping to finish this, the leather bits, and um, at the very least get all of the underpainting done for the hair. So everything up to before we start doing glazes. At the very least, that's what I'm hoping to get to. And I just realized, yeah, I missed um, on this guy. He's got that shirt, and it peeks between his armor there, and I didn't paint it. So I'll have to go back and do that. I'll probably just do that off camera. Um, the technique is going to be exactly the same as what I showed you last time with that shirt. So I'm just going to clean that area up real quick off camera sometime probably. Or maybe at the end of the whole model when I'm doing kind of the cleanup phase, I'll go in and do that part. Lots of extreme weather out there in the, the U.S. for sure. I'm not sure about the whole world, but hope everybody's been safe this week and hope all your families are, are doing well. I know there's crazy storms on the East Coast, lots of flooding. Out here we're having record heat wave in terms of record for this time of year. Pretty sure the last two days we've broken records. Um, today was uh, 116. Yesterday was 117, I think. Um, and this time of year when it starts to spike like that, we don't even drop below 100. I mean, overnight you get to like midnight, it's still 100 degrees outside. So probably after I do my paint stream tonight, expecting to go jump in the swimming pool, which is only marginally cooler than the outside air. It's probably like the pool water is like 90 or 92 degrees right now. It feels almost more like a like a sauna than a swimming pool. Yeah, 
Yeah, I hate it when you miss a step and have to go back. It happens. Luckily, it's a, it's not a very obvious place, which is kind of why I missed it. Um, when you miss spots that are sort of recessed like that, you can take a couple shortcuts. You don't quite have to do as many layers or be quite as precise with your details because it's pretty hard to see down in there. You just want a little bit of an indication of texture and color. Between uh, missing a spot or getting paint, you know, realizing you got paint on a spot that you had already finished, but you didn't catch it when it was wet, stuff like that. I, pretty much every model I paint at some point has I have to go back and fix something on it. It's just part of the process. I one time had a model that I finished, and I had no idea that I had gotten like a bunch of paint on my thumb and had basically rested my thumb against the face of the model and then had been like finishing stuff up. And I didn't even notice until I went outside to varnish the model. And I'm like, oh, this like green troll has a giant purple thumbprint on his face. And it was just some kind of little last detail that I was doing and somehow, you know, from paint on the bottle or something, it got all over my, my thumb and that was not fun. telling the story a couple streams ago or no actually I um, I think I was telling it on that interview that crit crit fail podcast did with me earlier this year um, I just happened to be re-listening to part of that interview the other day but I was explaining about my worst well at the I've had two really really bad uh, model breakage incidents in my life like two really bad ones you know there's lots of times where you like knock a model over or something a piece breaks off or you get paint chipped but um, the the two worst that I had I used to play 40k and I had a thousand sons army and I had done a custom converted Terminator Lord. He was built out of the, um, I'm bad with names after all this time, the Imperial Fist special character guy, is it Lysander? Something like that. Anyway, he had been my, my base for all the conversion for it, but I basically done all these weapon swaps. I had filed off stuff I had resculpted like chaos symbols and things and given him a banner given him new weapons all sorts of stuff and uh, I was showing him off to somebody and I dropped him I and I wasn't holding him over the game table anymore so when I dropped him he went all the way to the floor and the game store is basically concrete floors with a thin wood veneer over the top, but it's essentially as hard as concrete. And the model hits and just shatters into a million pieces. I also had a like a partially scratch built, there's a huge amount of conversions um, on a Chaos Dreadnought. And one of the features of this Dreadnought was he had this huge oversized exaggerated twin-linked LAS cannon for one of his arms. And as I bend over to start picking up the pieces of this shattered model that had been one of the prized parts of my army, that twin-linked LAS cannon caught on the back of my shirt and I pulled him off the table and he hit the ground and shattered as well. That was not a good day. Um, the other war paint, are you talking about the purple uh, thumbprint? Yeah, unfortunately it didn't look good. You know, that's that could be one of those cases where the 
happy accident. It's like, oh man, that actually looks sweet. No, it looks terrible. Um, there was all this nice subtle highlighting and shading and um, I thought for a second, I just picked up the finished model and <laughs> painted over. I almost had a real life example of, uh, of one of these moments. Um, No, it didn't, it didn't look good, but anyway, so that was one case. The other case was um, when I, I had my Trollbloods army for War Machine, and um, I didn't have every model that I owned painted, but I had quite a large collection of, of them painted at this point, point. and I had been sealing everything with dull coat, which is a great product. I love the finish that it gives miniatures. Um, the problem with dull coat is, and I didn't really, I didn't know this at the time because that was when I was just first starting to use it, is that it's not actually truly a varnish. It's just a finish. So it doesn't have any of the hardeners, or it has very little of the hardeners in it that actually protects your paint job. All it's really meant to do is give your your models a dull matte finish for which it's excellent at but but I didn't know that at the time so I had finished everything with just dull coat and so I was getting a lot of paint chipping and paint rubbing off and things like that off of you know the edges of swords and just little spikes or horns or things like that so one weekend I sat down and I touched up every painted model in the army all the little places where paint had been starting to rub off or chip off or I'd have a scratch or anything like that. I touched up everything. And then I sealed all of them with um, tester, or, um, Minwax Polycrylic, which is a really, really hard finish, um, polyurethane finish, and then re-coated them again with dull coat. And I was bringing them inside and I had them on a tray. So this was probably seven, represented about 75 percent well no it was about half of the painted models i had but this happened to be the tray that had all of my warlocks um, some of my favorite war beasts the best solos this was like the prime part of my painting collection um, hey heath what's up and um, because i had just varnished them but it was really hot outside i didn't want to leave them sitting in the garage so i varnished them i was bringing them inside and i was going to put them in a cabinet to finish drying so that my cats didn't get to them. And as I opened the cabinet door, it kind of stuck a little bit. And so as I pulled, you know, pulled a little hard, the tray just tipped just a little bit, just enough for some of the models to slide. And as soon as they slid, it changed the whole weight distribution of the tray and, and every single model dropped onto my wood floor. After I had just spent the whole weekend touching up the paint and re-varnishing them and uh, doing all that stuff. So that was my second really, really bad experience with um, model damage. But So uh, Heath, I'll, I was telling saying this earlier, but since you just got on, um, the reason I'm doing this is I'm actually going to try to finish these second versions of the busts up by the end of Saturday. So I'm probably going to, I'm potentially going to have a few streams that are going to be over the next few days. Um, because I'm going to send these to Gen Con with uh, the owner of Broken Egg Games, and he's going to be selling some of the busts there, and he wants the painted versions there to also um, attract attention, but then sell if, if I can sell them there. So um, I'm working hard to try to get these done. i got to hand them off to him on Sunday. All right, so we're going to switch over to SS Camo Medium Brown. So this will be the next layer of our leather. I got a cat who's not, not too happy with me right here. You probably heard him a second ago. And he found his toy. So you can see the difference. This is a little bit, um, 
a little bit lighter brown. It also starts to shift a little more towards the um, goldish brown. Um, the other brown had a little bit more red in it. This one shifts a little to the gold. Um, we're going to be glazing over these, so some of the subtleties is not that important. If you just get a little bit lighter brown, um, something that's a little bit different in hue, or um, sorry, a, a little bit different in darkness, um, like this, it, it'll work fine. So kind of like before with the, the leather, I'm really not going to be totally smooth with applying this. I'm gonna let some texture build up, at least some visual texture. The paint's so thin that you're really not getting uh, true 3D texture. but the rough surface kind of simulates. Uh, the impurities in the surface of leather. So Heath, I hope you're getting home from something fun like a game night or something as opposed to getting home from work this late. Um, by the way, on this sword leather, um, you can see that my brush strokes, I'm doing the, the brush strokes toward where the highlights are going to be. Uh, let me finish this up and I'll show you on the other model. So you can see that um, we've got the darker leather underneath and we've got the, the brighter leather on top for where the highlights are hitting to kind of match how it's hitting on the metal and stuff too. So I'm just going to be brushing, moving my brush in the direction. It's just water. I'm moving in the direction of that. What? There's a bird that can stay in the air for four years without landing? I'm, there's not even that many birds who live for four years, are there? I guess like parrots and parakeets and things can live a really long time. I 
definitely have a concept for how long some of the big birds like albatross and uh, pelicans and things like that. I don't have any kind of clue what their lifespan is. Way to go super dark there. I don't even think birds live that long. I would imagine it's probably some kind of ocean bird or something, right? That would. Otherwise, there's not much reason to stay in the air that long. By the way, the, the sword that I was just painting, and there's, there's uh, leather bits. Um, he's got, it's got a leather handle but it also has um, leather on the bottom part of the blade right here. So that's leather as well. Any, um, anybody out there in chat know why that sword has leather on the bottom of the blade? I do, this is a, a trivia question for you guys. Do you know Heath? Nope. Is that a nope? All right. I'll tell you. So the type of sword that they have on this guy is called a claymore. It is a really, really large sword, two-handed sword. And two-handed swords are really good for certain purposes. You can generate a lot of power with your swing. They're very heavy. Um, they can be used as anti-cavalry, they can punch through armor better, they're just, they have their uses. Um, just like in RPGs, they usually do extra damage, right, these big swords. However, they do have a weakness, and that is that if you are fighting somebody who doesn't have a two-handed sword, they just have a normal, like, one-handed sword, if they can get inside and get close to you when fighting, they have a big advantage because it's very hard for you to swing your sword against them while they're inside of your reach. So what, you, what the leather there is for is you move one hand off of the normal handle up onto the leather on the blade and it shortens the, the um, sword for you and it's like choking up on a baseball bat. You have a lot more control over your sword um, and so you can use it more like a, uh, a, little bit more, a little more easy to defend and attack when somebody's uh, in close quarters with you. So it's there for choking up on the sword. We're gonna add some ochre brown to this. SS Camo ochre brown. So this is kind of like a, a little bit of a mustard color. Um, I'll show it to you a little bit on the palette. It looks a little different when this comes out. But. So it's kind of a little bit of a flesh slash mustard color. It's a little more yellow than what it looks like on camera from what I can tell. So we're gonna add a little bit of this to the, the paint. This is going to start to lighten that brown. <laughs> 
you do get the same advantage, disadvantage if you have a spear versus a sword. A little bit less uh, way to mitigate that with the spear, though. Um, so one of the things I used to do when I was a younger person, um, I was part of the local SCA, the Society for Creative Anachronism, and they do medieval combat. And shortly after I started doing that, I actually hurt my wrist pretty badly. And so it was very, very hard for me to wield a sword. Because it takes a lot of strength in your wrists to fight with a sword. So I switched over to fighting with a pike, um, which is basically a 10 foot long spear. And yes, if the, um, the sword and shield type fighters, if they got in close on you, all you could do was back up, really. And you had to hope that one of the other people in your, your army slash unit would take care of the guy for you. That was one of the things that you would kind of practice on is what to do, you know, if the lines get charged, depending on what kind of weapon you held and what position in the line you were at. Spears were great for blunting the charge, but then as soon as they hit the lines, you had to back up, and then you'd have people collapsing in on the flanks of the, the guys attacking the spearmen, if they could. If they couldn't, all your spearmen would die. I finally quit um, because uh, I ended up when I got married and then we bought our first house. The only house we could afford at the time was way, way outside of town. And the SCA group would meet in downtown Phoenix. And I, uh, I lived in like beyond the suburbs of Phoenix. So it was with no traffic it was probably um, at least an hour drive, but probably longer, even with no traffic, to get to where the SEA practices and stuff were. And they would always meet in the middle of the week. They would meet on Wednesdays or Tuesday nights or something like that. And so people didn't really start getting there and things didn't start kind of happening until about 7.38. And then you have, you're have you there for a couple hours, things wrap up around 10. By the time you get all your armor off, you get home, you lay everything out because it's super sweaty and disgusting, you take a shower. It would often end up being something like you know, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. And by that time, you know, I had to wake up for work in like three or three and a half hours and I really just couldn't, I couldn't make that work. So I quit. And then when I moved a little bit more back into town, I just never picked it back up again.
one of my fondest memories of doing the SCA stuff was when I, the, the one and only time I actually went and participated in a war, which are these just massive organizational events that they do where people from all over, you know, all different states all get together. They basically form two different armies and you do like a whole weekend worth of, sometime a whole week's worth of different types of battle scenarios and, you know, people different sides would earn points over the weekend. It was just crazy to, to really see in person like two medieval armies lined up to fight each other. And, um, you know, everything there, I had been doing it for a while, but my participation was relatively casual. But I remember there, somebody on our side, it was a group from Tucson, which is in Southern Arizona. And I guess they're kind of these famous group of warriors in SCA within the state, at least that they would drill. They were a pike and spear unit, and they would just drill together. And so they, they would practice all the techniques that like spear units actually used in the medieval times, you know, how you would have multiple layers of attack. So, you know, as people, um, as people approach, you've got your first layer who then like back and then the next layer attacks and so attacking through things. And they just like, they had it down to a science, and then they had halberdiers who would then come up over the top when the shields would come in to try to create a shield wall. The halberdiers would come over the top, and like you would just watch them with machine precision, just take down unit after unit that they would they would encounter on the battlefield. Um, it was amazing. I actually tried to jump into their unit, just like in the back, just to kind of fight with them because I had this I had all pike also, um, and they were gracious enough to let me do it, but. I got killed by crossbowmen who were flanking us pretty quickly when I did that. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I just went up in Heath's book because I did SCA. Something else I remember from that, my, the, um, there were some people who didn't really like, I, I did a whole like homemade um, tabard, you know, with the heraldry and everything on it. And I painted up when I, when I fought with the shield, sword and shield, I painted up my shield as well. I eventually dropped that, but my brother um, did it with me as well. And we basically made the same, uh, the same tabards and the same shields. But we decided to use our family crest for our design. And the O'Brien last name, the typical family crest you always see associated with it, um, is three lions that are half gold and half silver. And that's usually like a royalty type heraldry. Um, and it comes from Brian Boru, who was the first High King of Ireland. And then the O'Brien name came from the sons of Brian and then also just people who were um, like attached to them. You didn't necessarily, you weren't necessarily always bloodline eventually, but you know, part of that group. That's where the name was handed down. Well, the heraldry looks an awful lot like Richard the Lionheart's who has the three lions, but they're all gold instead of half gold and half silver. So there was a bunch of people that thought, and even when I would try to explain to them, they wouldn't listen, that I was basically trying to wear Richard the Lionheart's uh, crest, and they didn't think that was appropriate. I just ignored them, but I always thought that was interesting. And even the people I could convince would say things like, well, why would you want to fight under your family crest? What if you like, potentially bring dishonor to your family by something you do? I wouldn't want to fight underneath my own family crest. And I always thought, like, 
what do you think I'm going to do out here that's going to like bring shame to my family because I'm, I don't know. It's just a really weird experience from that side of things. But most of the people were very cool. That I think that kind of came from sort of some of the quote unquote kingdom royalty who tended to go to these things and be more involved in the, the heraldry and the, all that stuff rather than actually just getting out there and fighting. I never heard from anybody who was an actual fighter that they had any problem with what I was wearing. All right, I'm gonna go to some Thar Brown for the last stages on this. I miss the same people that you run into in anything, you know, like uh, like he's saying. Um, you know, the same people like in miniature painting who will say things like, like, oh, you know, I only paint with metallic paints and like anyone who does non-metallic is blah, 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 or the reverse of that or like, or they, they basically kind of act like there's only one right way to paint something. I mean, it's just in any field, any kind of thing. Too many people just think their way is the right way and they don't, uh, they don't respect other people's points of view on things. No matter what anybody says, I always know that Heath and Jesse have my back. Right, guys? <laughs> I have not heard the phrase, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Exactly. I also don't get it a lot of times like the hills they choose to, to die on like it's always stuff that doesn't matter to anybody like what does it matter that uh, somebody else likes to do something in a different way than you like, it doesn't hurt you it doesn't stop you from doing whatever you want to do We'll see you soon, Jesse. The grumpy cat finally went over there and curled up and is sleeping on his his perch. Did you do this guy already? I don't think so.
What are you doing to the models now? I missed it from earlier. Um, so this is the, like the leather straps that go along um, the different parts of the model, the leather on his sword. So that's what I'm working on now. The next step, once I get that finished, that I'll, I'll continue on tonight is to start working on the hair. So this is just all the underpainting, you know, building up that under texture before we glaze on the top. And it wasn't too long ago, only a couple years ago, that I had never, had never done any of the glazing technique. Um, every model I painted was. Start with dark, work your, start with the darkest color, work your way up to the lightest for every section. Which tends to get you very pastel finishes. That's just how I painted for years and years and years. One of the things that I've had to get used to is having things that don't look very good <laughs> in the intermediate steps. Um, Like this sword really looks nothing like what it's going to look like. And I just have to kind of have faith that it will look right when I'm done. Um, whereas before, you could always see where you were at. And if you're just adding paint on top of other paint, you're never going back over and repainting anything with glazes or shades or anything. That was something that took a little while to get my brain to accept. I think we're ready. So first glaze is a mixture of brown leather that is not brown leather. So brown leather is a darker reddish brown. Gonna get a fresh, fresh one for this. So that, and we're gonna mix in some uh, ink tense chestnut. So this is a chestnut ink. Um, I wish I had written down the ratio of the two. Oh, it'll look all right either way. I think it might be a little more than ink.
this first glazing color is not really meant to be a shader. We're just going to be tinting the color, um, restoring the more rich brown colors to it. So you don't really have to be too careful about the direction of your brush stroke. I'm not trying to push paint down to the recesses or anything. Just trying to coat all of the areas we just painted. We'll have a second, um, a second glaze color. We're going to add some black to what's here, and uh, that'll be more for shading. Eventually we'll paint the buttons as well there, like on this leather there and then on the, the kind of buttons, they're like little studs. And they're also on all of his little leather armor. I'll do those the same time I do the metal. It's basically the same color as like the sword and the axe. Sorry, the uh, internet's not working well for you, man. Oh no, the spinning circle of death. One of the reasons for this mixture that I'm using for the glaze, um, you don't often see me put uh, inks into my colors. Like you'll usually just see me glaze with straight paint, right? Thin down with water, but uh, there's nothing else added to it. But one of the things that the inks do is they tend to give you a little bit more of kind of a, a little bit of a glossy look. And a little bit more like richness to the color, which is really good for you know, this dyed leather that we're going for here.
So for the time being, the one caveat to the not worrying about the direction of the brush strokes is on the leather here on the sword handle and, and the blade. I'm going to start to do more of a concerted effort to move my brush towards the recesses because this is going to be this is going to be the trickiest part where for building up a transition. Like most of the other area, we're not really building up like a smooth variant from light to dark. Uh, but we're doing that a little bit more on the sword handle, so I'm going to be uh, being a little bit more careful at that point. Cool. I'm glad you're back. Kind of crazy just how different the hobby is now from when I started. And there was nobody streaming painting. There wasn't uh, good, easy ways to access lots of tutorials on the web. You know, basically the tutorials you got were in the White Dwarf magazine that Games Workshop would put out. Or, you know, guys at your local hobby store who kind of knew what they were doing. <laughs> I would show you a couple things. The amount of information that's out there now is just staggering, really. All different styles and techniques and paint companies and everything. You can learn anything you need to. And it's just a matter of practicing. Kind of crazy how this glazing technique works. It's almost like magic. I swear. Do you remember what this looked like just a couple minutes ago? And now it's like looks like leather. I don't know. Yeah, it was just a few years ago. I think it was when we were moving to our current house now, so probably like two, two and a half years ago. Um, I finally got rid. I had so many old white dwarfs. And then at some point along the line, because I didn't want to store that many, I had gone through and torn out all the reference images and the tutorials that I wanted to keep and then had them all in a drawer. And then I finally ended up just tossing them because I had never looked at them in like 20 years. And when I finally did go back and look at them, like techniques and paint and everything has changed so much since back then. But I look at these tutorials and go like, that's like, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even follow this anymore. Um, it's kind of weird. Only ones I kept were the ones that had pictures of my, my models in them. I've got a few old white dwarfs and I've got some annual catalogs that had pictures of my stuff in it. It's 
Did I ever tell you guys the story about how there's um, there's models that I painted that are in a GW annual catalog, but they have somebody else's name on them? Boys and girls, pull your pull your chairs up around the old transistor radio here. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> oh, um, so back when I used to do commission painting of like full armies and stuff, back when I was in college, this guy contacted me. I won't give his full name out. We'll just call him Steve. Steve contacts me and he's like, hey man, I am a Warhammer Fantasy player. I love the game. I'm pretty good at it. But I can't compete in the grand tournaments. I just can't like place in the top positions because I'm not a good painter. I don't paint my army. And at least at that time, a big chunk of the score for, it was like a sportsmanship score, there was a painting score, there was an actual wins-losses score, and then there was something else. I think there was four components to the score. And he would always lose out in the painting category. And he's like, all right, I want you to paint my army for me. And he actually bought a few models that were already painted that I had had for uh, an old army I was getting rid of. So he bought those and then he commissioned the rest of the army. So I did them, I painted them, sent them off to him. And I didn't know it at the time, but you were supposed to have to check a box at the tournament that said whether you painted your own army or not. Because I guess you weren't actually, um, you couldn't get the, the points for army painting if somebody else painted your army for you, because that kind of wasn't the point. So he goes to a grand tournament, checks the box that says, uh, checks the box that says, yes, I painted my own army so he can get the painting points for it. Lo and behold, he wins the whole thing. He's grand master of the tournament. Again, I, did, I still didn't know at the time that that's how those things worked, but he contacted me, he told me what happened. He's like, hey, you know, I won, I won Grand Master thanks to your painting and some luck of the dice and my playing and blah, blah, blah. He's like, I just want to tell you how grateful I am. Here's like an extra 50 bucks. I'm just going to give you a tip because you helped push me over the edge. At the time, I was like, yeah, this is great. I'm, I'm glad it worked for you. I'm glad for the tip. You know, cool. Then the, uh, the GW annual catalog comes out the next year. And in the high elf section, there's pictures of those models. And they say, you know, so-and-so's model that won the grand master of the whatever tournament painted by Steve. <laughs> it's like, well, because he had marked that he painted, um, he painted his own army, they had the army then listed under his name. Now, the moral of all of this story, though, is that I was not, or the end of the story is I was not all that upset because the army was painted well, but it wasn't painted to the, the best of my abilities. And on the exact same page are not only the models that they say that he painted, but there's also models they say that I painted that actually won Golden Demon Awards and looked better than the models that they said he painted. So the fact that I actually 
look like a better painter than myself on the same page, but that the wor that the lower models are somebody else's name, I guess I'll, I'll uh, I'm not too upset about that, but it's just a funny story. And the reason I know about how the, the tournament worked and what he must have done is because I followed up with somebody. When I saw that, I was like, well, why, why did they put his name on him? Don't they ask who paints the army? And that's when somebody says, well, you have to mark that you painted your own army. And Yeah, so your internet were, was being trouble was being caused by other people on the same server, same Wi-Fi. Makes sense. I sometimes wonder if that's what happens with mine when, like, really early in my stream, um, it often seems to like have a bunch of trouble right right at the beginning, and it's not having trouble before I actually get on and start talking. But usually, when I start to stream, my wife goes off in the other room and starts. Um, that's too much black. Um, what are we supposed to do when we add dark colors to lighter colors? We're supposed to put it off to the side and add it slowly at a time. Not even following my own advice. This is what happens. Anyway. Dang, I remember you talking about a lot about how history is written with by perspective. Specific perspectives, yeah. Yep. All right, we're just gonna mix up a little bit more of this. So I've got a little bit darker color now. I'm for these raised areas. I'm focusing mostly on where there's sort of crevices, kind of going up to where there's folds and stuff in the leather. Also anywhere where you might have shadows. So as you get up near other surfaces, kind of underneath the buttons, down here where it starts to curve. You can hit a couple places where there's some like folds and the, the paint will kind of run down a little bit into those crevices and make them a little darker. Yeah, um, Mr. Heath's talking about sharing bandwidth with your neighbors, too, that your neighbors can drag your internet connection down as well. It's absolutely true.
So here I'm trying to kind of go over the transition, start a little bit above it, pull below, down into the shadow. Start to get a nice gradient for that. I don't even know if I completed my thought from before. So I think my wife usually when I start streaming will go off and then she turns on the another TV and we have all of our all of our stuff is all over the Wi-Fi. So if she's starting a movie or something, it might be some of that. Uh, initial downloading or something that happens that might be interfering with the beginning of my stream sometimes. you <laughs> Yeah, it depends on the situation. So the question is, do I find it better to work up to a lighter color or start with a lighter color and tone it down? Um, I tend to, at this point in my painting career, uh, I tend to start with the middle, raise it up to the lighter color, and then either glaze over it or then add the shade um, afterwards. Uh, for most of my painting career, I would start with the darkest possible color in a area and bring it all the way up to the lightest color and I wouldn't go back in and do any glazing or shading that just wasn't the style that I was doing at that time um, but yeah for the glazing techniques and anytime you're doing like really thin even glazes for shadows and stuff you kind of want to do those parts last because um, you tend to use darker richer colors to do the glazing and the shading so you kind of need to have some of that other stuff built up because then if you start going over it with lighter colors, you lose that richness. You'll tend to start shifting over into the more pastel colors uh, for highlights and things like that. So if you're doing any glazing where you want to restore saturation, you want to have all your highlights, most of your highlights built up before you start doing that. But to kind of go along with my theme from earlier, I mean, there's really there's no one true way to paint. And the most important thing is finding something that works for you, works for the style that you're trying to achieve, it works for the paints that you use, it works for you know, what kind of finishes you like. Do you like a more pastel palette? Do you like something that's really rich and saturated? And what are you trying to achieve? 
and then you know experiment around a little bit and figure out what works for you try um, mimicking what other people are doing in different styles and see if you can pick up a few tricks and see if it you know find something that clicks for you I'd be the last person to ever tell somebody that you know the way that I paint is the best way or the only way or the only thing I will say is that my way is the slow way so as long as you want to spend as much time as possible painting your miniatures you should absolutely follow the techniques that I'm showing you. I was I was laughing a little bit because there's there's this guy Trent um, on Facebook or on uh, Twitter he paints like insanely fast like I swear five or six hours and he's got like a whole bust painted and it's fantastic and he's just mastered the, like the minimum effort maximum reward um, painting style like, his stuff is fantastic but I swear he's putting out like two or three just immaculate pieces of artwork every week. On the other hand, there's somebody, I'm not totally sure how she pronounced her name, but, um, but she, she is McGee painting or Maggie painting or something like that. And she posted a miniature the other day. She's like, I tried to force myself to speed paint today. So here it is, here's a miniature in nine hours, which to me is as fast as I could possibly ever go. And you look at it and it's still really good, but it's kind of like how I feel like what would happen if I did that same thing. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna speed paint this miniature. I'm gonna paint it in one day. I've only got eight or nine hours to do it. And I get done with it, I'm like, it's pretty good. Like, I just don't know, I don't know, I have not perfected the, the techniques that other people like, um, Banshee or Trent or some other people that can seem to paint much, much faster. I think they do, they tend to do a lot of wet blending on their miniatures. They're not as concerned with hiding brush strokes. Um, for them, it's more of like trying to capture a certain feel. And so they work a lot quicker. Just about ready to call. I think I'm gonna call that guy done on the a little bit more touch up on this. So thoughts on what style in miniature painting. So I can talk a little bit about it here. I don't. I wouldn't have like a lot of examples I can call up at the like at a moment's notice. But um, so I 
Like one of the things that you can try to do when you're painting miniatures is you can try to get your miniatures to look like super realistic. So there's miniature painters out there. Um, a lot of times historical busts and historical miniatures, um, like 75 millimeter historical scale or historical miniatures and stuff. You'll see people who try to make things look like, like completely real life. Like this stuff is super smooth. Um, everything is perfect. It's kind of akin to in the art world, you know, the classic uh, landscape painters where you know, what they basically painted was it looks like a photograph of, some, of something. So you take the photograph, you take the painting, you're like, I can barely tell the difference between these. It's, it's perfect. But then in canvas painting, you also have people like Vincent van Gogh who had very little um, intention to capture something that looked realistic. Instead, he used color and texture and brush strokes to evoke something in his artwork that wasn't about capturing something like perfect. Or you have like Monet, who again was not trying to capture something um, like photorealistic, but was rather trying to capture other types of things with the texture and techniques used. So miniature painting is very similar to that. You have a whole like school led by Banshee who has the saying F smoothness. And so for them, it's all about using the brush strokes to capture feeling and motion on the miniature. Um, they apply paint a little bit more roughly. The blends aren't seamless, but the color is very vibrant or you know very moody for the piece. Um, you get people like um, like Roman Lapot, who does tons of object source lighting. And so he'll, he'll also is kind of a little bit of that where he's not always about perfectly smooth blends, but he does lots of things where I've got a guy and I want to make it look like there's a fire in, like near him. And so, you know, he's got backlit by blue, cold moonlight. He's front lit by fire, but he's got like little flecks painted where you're getting bright, like um, pops from the fire or something, you know, just like little bright spots all over. Um, You've got people who, what I used to do was try to make my miniatures look more cell shaded a little bit, so more like they were animations, um, which is completely different from what they're doing. I'm trying to make them look more like they were something that would be like a 2D cell drawing. Um, so really, I mean, there's, there's almost like an infinite number of different things that people are trying to achieve when they're painting their miniatures and looks that they're trying to go for. And uh, each one of those styles kind of commands different painting techniques, different color usages, different paints, um, or at least they're used best with those types of things. So that's a little bit about different paint techniques. Um, you know, these particular busts are painted a little bit more in a realistic style. Um, not 100%, but they're, they're attempted to be a little bit more um, realistic looking. Whereas, you know, the, uh, the dwarves that I'm painting, I'm not necessarily going for exactly that. They're supposed to be a little bit closer to kind of cute little animations and things like that. In terms of what, what the feel that I'm going for. All right, let's start working on this hair. I don't know, does that answer any of your questions? Do you have any follow-ups to that? Um, it'd be much easier if I was like, flipping through a catalog book or something that had lots of pictures, but, um, or I give you access to the, I don't know, probably at this point, like the 10 gigabytes uh, inspirations folder that I have on my computer saved of pictures from all other people's works that are just all different styles and, and things that they're trying to achieve. Uh, let's see. Camo medium brown. So I'm going to use the same brown. This was the first of the layers that we did for the leather. This is what I'm going to, to paint their hair on. Now, 
just like with the leather where it looked really different, looked kind of weird until we actually put the glaze on top that made it look more like leather. We're gonna have something sort of similar here where this is not really gonna look like how their hair looks until we get near the end stage. And in fact, the first half of this is almost a great tutorial for how to paint blonde hair, which people often struggle with. Um, the reason people a lot of times will struggle with blonde hair is that they use like actual yellow paints to paint their blonde hair. It's almost like they're trying to do what The Simpsons does, which is use yellow like coloring to, to signify blonde hair. But blonde hair, like I have dark blonde hair, like my hair does not look yellow. Um, you know, most natural looking blonde hair does not look yellow. It actually is more of just kind of a light brown. And so um, really what you want to do for blonde hair is stick to like light browns. Um, you want to use ochres off-white colors and things like that. You really don't want something that has a really strong yellow tone to it because it's going to start making the hair look really artificial. So yeah, you were like just asking yourself what does it really mean to, um, to have a style and how do you develop your own style. And I honestly, I don't know many people who would who develop a style consciously. I think what happens is, at least this is certainly what happened for me. This, this paint's very thin, it's gonna take forever. So the, when I first started painting, the guy who was the best painter around that I saw his stuff on a routine basis, one of the ways I learned, I thought his stuff was really, really cool. It was the coolest models I'd ever seen in person. And again, back then you didn't really see a lot of wide variety of style. Everything was kind of variations on the GW theme. And this guy in particular, his stuff was a little bit different. Um, a little more extreme highlighting, like animation kind of style. And one of the early ways that I was learning to paint was I was I would stare at his models in the case and I would try to emulate what I saw. So I would go home and I would like I would make mental notes as I would stare at his stuff. And I would ask, how did he possibly achieve that? And I wasn't the kind of guy who would ask, I, would, I wouldn't really want to sit down and have him explain it to me. I kind of wanted to figure it out. But in trying to go home and mimic the things that he was doing to learn how he achieved those finishes, my early models looked an awful lot like his. In fact, my when I would first start going to the Golden Demons, there were people who thought that stuff that I painted was stuff this other guy painted. Or they would say something like they would see me collect my models and they would say something like, oh, are you friends with, uh, with Brian? Because like, your stuff looks just like it. What's wrong? <laughs> so I wasn't, I wasn't certainly trying to purposely develop whatever style he had. I was just trying to figure out how he did what he did. Um, after a couple years of really perfecting my imitation of this guy's work, I started just subtly, things just changed. It wasn't even a conscious, um, a conscious change. It was just kind of like painting different models than what I used to paint, branching out into different paint lines. And I sort of almost, 
like, and I didn't even realize it till I went back one day and I was looking at old pictures and I was talking to somebody about pictures and they're like, you got kind of a subtle switch here to what you did. And I was like, really? And he started explaining it to me. I'm like, oh yeah, that's why my stuff started to look less and less like this other guy's. Um, so I was still doing in a similar, like anim more of an animation style painting. But his, the hallmark of his work was always large, like flat areas of color with several layers of very, like built, several built up layers right near the edge of stuff. So he'd have like large flat areas of kind of a darker color. And then right near the end, he would put several thin layers building up to an extreme highlight. So he had lots of, of, lots of attention right at the extreme uh, highlight points of different color areas. And over time, I started to actually flip that where all of my layers and transitions were built up near the shadow. And then I would have large flat areas of a lighter color that would then build out to just a little bit of a, of a highlight point near the end. And that was, again, not something I did consciously, but it was just my own tweak of what I did after, you know, kind of copying and um, what this other guy was doing. But it's just something that became a hallmark. And then from then on, I mean, once I started doing that, again, not necessarily consciously, people were starting to recognize my work as something that was unique and that they knew Im immediately when they would see a model they would know that I painted it because of that particular kind of trademark style that I developed kind of almost unconsciously by accident. Then a few years ago when I was getting out of playing and I sold my War Machine Army and I really wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to start trying new paint lines and I ended up buying the entire scale 75 paint line. And those paints just really, really acted differently from the paints I was used to. And I just started messing around with doing glazing. It just kind of instantly overnight changed how I was painting and now I have a very different style but I'm learning a lot more about how to control it, how to get it to do what I want it to do, how to achieve certain effects with it. And none of the things that I do now were necessarily consciously developed. They just kind of naturally came out of playing with the paints and learning things and then just the colors that I like to use and the models I like to paint just kind of slowly sharpen whatever skills that you learn. They sharpen them into a, um, a specific toolkit that kind of is a hallmark of what you do as a painter. Um, and it's gonna color and, not color as in like an actual color, but it's gonna influence everything you do from then on out. The, the colors you've gravitated towards, the specific skills and the little twists that you've done on them. Little things that you'll try of what happens if I shade my browns with a purple and then all of a sudden you think it looks awesome and then all your browns are always shaded with purple and um, and so a style is not something you consciously develop it's kind of a conglomeration of I mean you could I suppose but for most people it's just kind of a conglomeration of all the influences and then the little twists that you just kind of naturally will do as you adapt somebody else's um, techniques um, to the models that you're painting and the, the colors that you like to use. Yeah, the scale 75 are, are very, very different. And, and I've said this before too, but you know, this, each I'm paint... Not, I'm not sure. Alexa thought I was talking to her. Um, you know, each company develops their paint specifically to meet certain types of painting uh, techniques as well. Not that they can't be used for other things, but they... Um, that's funny that you guys, your wife thought my cat was one of your kids. 
Yeah, he just, I don't know what that was. He just sprinted into the room and then just started screeching and now he's gone. I don't know where he's at. But like I've mentioned before, you know, Games Workshop, who teaches there, you know, you do a layer or you do a base coat, you do a layer, you do a highlight, then you do a wash. That's kind of the basic technique they teach. So they've, they've created the foundation paints, you know, the base paints, which are thicker. They cover in one coat, so you just get a nice uh, coat. Then the layers are a little bit thinner, but then they're color coded to be a lighter version of whatever the bases are. Then they have the highlight, uh, the technical paints, like the, the edging and the dry brushing paints. Um, and then they, all, then they have washes. So the paint line that they have is intended to help people learn to paint in the quote unquote GW style. Scale 75 paints the people who are the painters that they were making for um, are very much in the airbrushing and glazing kind of school of painting. So their paints were designed to be best used by people who are using those painting techniques. And similar Vallejo and similar Reaper Master Series and all of that. They're always designed with painting in mind, especially uh, very consciously the, the P3 paints. From very early on, Privateer Press decided that they were going to be using the two brush blending style for painting all of their miniatures. And in fact, if you get a job there as a painter, They'll teach you to the brush blending if you don't already know it, but you are expected to use it. And so their paints were specifically designed to be fantastic for two brush blending. Yeah, they're good for other things, but that's that's what they're designed for. So that's really what they're best at. I've always kind of felt like Vallejo is intended to really be a layering paint. You know, a paint that you're applying several, several thin layers to build up a, a transition. Yeah, I never really mastered two brush blending. I didn't try too much. Um, when I was using a lot of P3 paints, it just wasn't the style I was into. Um, but their paints are actually pretty good for doing shading as well. Like you can thin them really down. Um, I'm not a chemist. I can't vouch for this for sure, but um, I've always heard people say that one of the things that sets the P3 paints apart and probably one of the reasons they chose this is because it must be best for two brush blending, but they use a liquid pigment as opposed to a ground up uh, physical like pigment, which is one of the reasons why you can really thin down P3 paints to almost any consistency and they still work. They don't just completely fall apart like GW paints will sometimes fall apart on you if you, when you over thin them. the uh, pigment starts to separate from everything. Anyway, so yeah, they have a liquid pigment, which is, again, probably best for two brush blending. But again, that's also why they're good for shading, because you can thin them down to any consistency and create a nice thin shade, shade it down into the recesses.
you would think it would make them good for glazing too, and they probably are okay at it. Um, the couple times I've tried, I was getting a little bit of inconsistency in color on the, the finish, but that might have been either user error or just the specific color I was using wasn't the best, because that's something else that is a little tricky, even with the Scale 75 colors, which are supposed to be really good for glazing. It really kind of depends on the color. Some colors are better than others. I make all sorts of silly mistakes, autocorrect and everything when I'm doing tweets and every time I post one and then there's a mistake, it irritates me because I'm like, dang it, I'm much better at grammar than this tweet would suggest. I know a lot of people are typing on their phones and stuff. It's It's hard to make it perfect. The other thing that could be tricky with the Scale 75 paints is for a lot of the cases I feel like they were meant to be airbrushed for base coating. They're not always the greatest paints for painting a first layer. It can take a couple passes, which can be a little annoying. He's back. It's just a cat, everybody. It's not a crying child.
just uh, it's just a cat. Diego. Diego. Hey. We're coming up on the two hour mark. Um, I'm going to do another pass on this as a base coat. My wife has peeked her head around the corner a couple times. I think she might be getting restless herself. So, finish this base coat and then I'll call it a night. Like I said, I probably will do another stream tomorrow for a couple hours. If you can make it, cool. Uh, if you can't, I understand. Like I said, I'm trying to finish these bases up. Um, or these uh, busts up for by Saturday night so I can ship them off to, to Gen Con for display models and maybe to get sold. Hey Jesse, have a good night. Um, yeah, the eyebrows certainly make a difference, especially as you the larger the model gets. You can really get to the point you can't skip them anymore. It looks really unnatural. You can already see that the face that was looking kind of weird before is already starting to look more realistic, just with outlining the uh, hairline and getting the eyebrows on there. But um, yeah, Jesse, take care. Good night. Um, I, it'll probably be somewhere around the same time tomorrow. Um, somewhere around 6 to 6.30 my time, maybe as late as 7 my time. Um, so I'm, one, I'm on Pacific time right now. Arizona is the fun state that doesn't observe daylight savings time, so we jump around throughout the year. But I'm on Pacific time right now, East Coast time. So somewhere between um, like 9 and... 10 Eastern time. I'll try to push forward earlier, but it's just kind of a, a matter of when we, when I can get my work finished up for the day and when we can get dinner finished. I'll post a, a tweet as soon as I have a pretty good idea when it's going to happen. Well, you only got a couple more months to wait. Once we hit what, sometime in October, switches back.
I kind of like it better when we're on Pacific time, honestly, only because uh, like all the all the East Coast time starts for sports and things all start earlier earlier in the year for us. So like when the football season starts, if there's an East Coast game, it's on at ten in the morning, which is nice. Get an earlier start to football. This is the finished model. I do not want to paint him. Yeah, I, I imagine those. That's why there's that uh, idea in sports. You know, the East Coast bias. All the East Coast sports writers and stuff tend to favor the East Coast players when they do voting and stuff like that. But it makes sense when West Coast games start at seven or seven o'clock Pacific Pacific time, and that means they're starting at ten o'clock Eastern time. Just can't expect people to watch all those games. I kind of feel like life just starts earlier in the day on the West Coast. Um, I know my dad always growing up he works for Charles Schwab so his day always kind of started with the opening bell of Wall Street but of course the uh, opening bell is like well, I, well depending on the time of year it's either seven o'clock or six o'clock in the morning here so he'd always get a really early start to his day but he'd be home fairly early I think a lot of business tends to kind of start a little earlier here to match up with a little closer with East Coast opening times for businesses. So I'm going to stop there for tonight. Yeah, be in Hawaii where it's like you're just in a completely different day pretty much from the rest of the United States. So here's where we're at. Uh, we've got the base coat on the hair. Like I said, what's going to happen is the hair is going to start looking a lot more like blonde hair until we start to glaze in the brown, kind of like the leather did earlier tonight. Um, 
but you can also take the first steps in what we're going to do and I'll finish up uh, the next time I stream on the hair is basically do everything that I do for the hair up until I start glazing the brown over it and that's basically how you would do blonde hair um, yeah so we're getting close uh, I'm gonna finish up the hair and then we just have a few little details like the buttons and the weapons and um, getting done so probably I would say if I had to guess uh, two more sessions or so um, then kind of a bonus session I'll do the the face paint on the, on these two models at least that's my current plan when I finish them I might I might take the easy way out and not actually paint them at the risk of ruining them but um, anyway so yeah so thanks for joining me tonight uh, Jesse Heath anybody else who was lurking there in the in the chat room um, I'll see you on the next stream thanks for joining me